Um, just to illustrate the first point, I'm going to highlight two studies which I think are representative of uh, the field, but there's lots of others. And the first one is a study that is in press in um, Journal of Autism, where Tracy and collaborator looked at the understanding of basic and social emotion in ASD. And they presented facial emotions to the children, and they presented the stimuli very fast, and then they asked them to answer in a limited time window. So again, that was a very challenging task. And what they found was that there was no difference between the ASD and the control groups, despite this limited exposure time and despite the limited response window. And what's also interesting is that both groups trended towards higher accuracy when they responded quickly. So what this means is that participants were using their intuitions because if they had used the compensatory strategy mediated by complex reasoning, then we would have seen a speed accuracy trade-off. If they had used this compensatory strategy, they would have been slower, um, uh, they would have been less accurate when asked to respond quickly. And what's interesting is that this is true in all conditions, even in conditions like pride or contempt, which we know require first-order theory of mind. The other study I want to point to is one by Wong and collaborators on irony comprehension in children in Boston. In their study, they compared three conditions. In the first condition, the child needs to pay attention to his encyclopedic knowledge, EK, and to the prosodic cue in order to detect irony. In the second condition, the only cue is encyclopedic knowledge, and in the third condition, the only cue is prosody. What they found was that there was a group difference in the first two conditions, but no group difference when prosody was the only cue to irony. So in the condition that was closest to our design, they too didn't identify any differences. But it gets even more interesting if you actually look at the pattern of accuracy rates in both groups. What I want to underline here is that in the typical group, you see very high scores, but in the ASD group, you also see very high scores. So it's quite interesting that we concentrate on this very little difference instead of explaining why you can see that they score above 80% in every condition. Why is this the case? Furthermore, in, in one study, just this, like in ours, they didn't see any um, differences in reaction time, so there's never a difference here. So what's the alternative? What I've been trying to show is that the underlying competence to recognize emotions appears to be there in at least a subgroup of individuals with an ASD. Um, and here it's important to note that all those studies are done with um, people with high-functioning autism who are very verbally able and so on. Um, so I'm not making any claims as to how this would generalize to the whole spectrum. But this underlying competence appears to be blocked by some other factor. One possibility is that the deficit is not to be found in the ability to read the mind and the voice, but rather in the natural inclination or drive to do so. And in a recent review, this is basically what Beecher and collaborators conclude. They say, children and adolescents demonstrate, with autism, sorry, demonstrate in many different ways that they have some understanding of emotions, but what particularly distinguishes them from match controls is their lack of spontaneous bias towards seeking those cues. In other words, the main deficit might be one of diminished social orienting or social attention um, rather than one of uh, theory of mind or social understanding. Um, if, if this is true, then we should manage to enhance performance by boosting social attention by extrinsic factors. And here's an illustration of how this may work. It's again a study by Wong and collaborators on the understanding of irony in the, in the voice in autism. The top line here is typical devel typically developing adults listening to ironical statements. And the bottom line is the autism group. As you can see, the, some of the activity that's present in the TD group is not there in the autistic group. 
But that's with very neutral instructions. And look what happens if you just say, if you give specific instructions where you explicitly ask the participant to pay attention to the social cue. Here, the activity of the network totally normalizes in both in the AESD group. So in the time I have left, I'm just going to quickly show you two studies on social interest in autism, uh, just because I've finished analyzing the data and it's quite exciting and um, relevant to what I've just said. So I'm just going to quickly show you that. The first one is about the distracting effect of social and non-social stimuli. In a context where we explicitly tell the participant to ignore the stimulus. So if participants decide to look at the stimulus, then it gives us a, a measure of the power those stimuli have to capture our attention. In other words, it's a measure of um, social interest. It's a way to quantify social interest. And in the second study, I looked at the consequences of diminished social interest in skills that are closely linked to social motivation. So for example, reputation management, politeness, or flattery. And that's how we did it. So we asked participants to engage in this group task where all you have to do is say in what color the stimulus is written. So here you have to say blue, red, blue, green. But look, it's going to get much harder. Here you have to say blue, but there's a conflict between what's written and the ink in which it's written. And here you have to say red. The difference between neutral trials on the left-hand side here and incongruent trials on the right-hand side is what we call the Stroop effect. What we did is that we checked the influence of social and non-social distractors on this Stroop effect. And remember, we told participants to ignore them. Um, and here is what we found. It's quite funny because there's no effect of distractor type. But this is merely because the type of distractor has exactly the opposite effect in both groups. In the TD group, um, flowers are significantly less distracting than eyes. And in the ASD group, it's exactly the opposite. Flowers are more distracting than eyes. Right, so now this is the last thing I'm going to show you. And it's a study about reputation management and flattery behavior. So the idea is that if you're less interested in social things, you're also less likely to try and manipulate your audience in order to please them. So what I mean is that if I say, do I look good in this dress? People are going to say, yeah, you do, even if there's things that actually no. But people try to have smooth interactions with everyone. So this is how we measured it. We asked participants to rate drawings that were either, uh, oops, sorry, that were oops, 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 poor in quality, medium or high. And um, what we did is that we compared the rating they gave when the drawer of the drawings was present and when the drawer of the drawings was absent. We asked, so the way it worked is that my colleague Kathy would ask children to rate all the drawings one by one on a seven point Likert scale, so this scale here. And then she would leave and say, okay, I'm done, so now Carly is going to come in and do other things with you. I would come in and I would say, oh, so what have you been up to with Kathy? And the child would say, I was rating those drawings, etc. So I would pick the pile of drawings and say, oh, you were rating them. And I would casually go through all the drawings, pretending I had never seen them. And at some point, I would stop and say, oh, so how much do you think this one should get? So that's the second drawing, right? Control drawing. And after, um, and, and, and on another drawing, I would say, oh, wow, that's my drawing. I drew this picture. That's funny. How much do you think this one should get? And that's the experimental rating, okay? Sneaky. Um, and so the hypothesis was that in typical development, we would see an increase between the first and the second drawing on the experimental drawing only, so on my picture. And that's exactly what we found. So in the control condition, they don't increase their score, okay? But when I say, oh, that's my drawing, 
they give me one extra point. And that's what happens in ASD teenagers. By the way, I forgot to include the, the figures, but I can say more about matching and so on afterwards. Um, right, so I thought it was worth showing you this. So to conclude, the initial observation was that the pattern of communicative strengths and deficits that we see in ASD appears to be best captured by diminished social attention rather than by impaired theory of mind. Uh, and that has consequences for um, research because if social attention is a crucial factor, then it means that we need to control for it. So when you, in order to really know what people are able to do or not do, so if you present faces and houses to participants with ASD, the first control you need to have is make sure they paid attention to the whole thing. And the other implication is the intervention, because of course the strategies are going to be very different if the problem is one of social orienting or attention, or if the problem is one of mind reading abilities. Um, so I'm going to end by thanking um, all my collaborators on those projects and the people who gave me the money to do it, and all the children and staff in the uh, special education schools and mainstream schools in the UK that took part in the study, and, and you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.